welcome to the award-winning show, Holding Down the Fort by U.S. Vet Wealth. We returned for season six to answer the biggest question for career military families. So when are we going to get out? And everything involved with answering this question. I'm Jen Amos, creator and co-host of Holding Down the Fort and a Gold Star family member and veteran spouse. And I'm Jenny Lynn Stroop, co-host and chief shower upper here on Holding Down the Fort. Together, we will converse with special guests from and for our military community to share knowledge and resources and relevant stories on how we can best hold down the fort while on active duty, going through transition, and into post-military life. Now, let's get into the show. You are not alone if you have a child that requires a lot of medical care or educational care. We got your back. A quote by Michelle Norman. As the founder and executive director of Partners in Promise, Navy spouse of over 25 years and mother of a daughter with cerebral palsy, Michelle Norman and her team challenge the systematic problems of public education by protecting the rights of military children in special education. She educates on the initiatives of the Promise Act, reveals the 2021 Military Special Education Survey findings, celebrates their most recent win, credits her tribe, shares how her daughter is empowered to be a voice for the voiceless, and much more. Michelle, it was an absolute pleasure having you on our show. Thank you so much again for joining us. And before we dive into today's conversation, I want to go ahead and let you all know about our sister podcast show called The Spouse Benefit Plan, which is all about helping career military families make confident and informed decisions to keep or opt out of the survivor benefit plan. Check out our most recent episode, episode number four, which is titled, If You Had to Choose Between 100 Cups of Wine or 55 Cups of Wine, Which One Would You Pick? And the description goes, How important is it for you and your family to protect the military pension? In this episode, episode four, we recap how the military pension is more than just a retired monthly pay by reiterating the wine analogy in our previous episodes. Remember to refer to the last episode to learn how to calculate your estimated retire pay, total retirement benefit, and present value. We'll continue to explain what these numbers mean and how they relate to understanding the survivor benefit plan. Once again, that episode is now available on the Spouse Benefit Plan podcast. You can subscribe now on your preferred podcasting platform, or check out the website, thespousebenefitplan.com. All right, with that said, thank you so much for listening. Now, please enjoy our conversation today with Michelle Norman. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the award-winning podcast show, Holding Down the Fort. I am your creator and co-host, Jen Amos. And even though it always says it in the actual intro, I can't help but repeat it because it helps me warm up for a conversation. As always, I have my co-host with me, Jenny Lynn Stroop. Jenny Lynn, welcome back. Hey, happy to be here today. Yes. And we are extremely excited because I actually only had a chance to meet this incredible woman once at Mill Spouse Fest last year when she was giving the keynote speech. But I feel like I didn't talk to her enough. So this is why we brought her on (laughs) so we can have a conversation with Michelle Norman. So let me go ahead and introduce her. Michelle Norman is the founder and executive director of Partners in Promise, Promise standing for Protecting the Rights of Military Children in Special Education. She is a Navy spouse of over 25 years and a mother of a 17-year-old daughter with cerebral palsy. So without further ado, Michelle, welcome to Holding Down the Fort. Thank you, Jen and Jenny Lynn. It is such a pleasure to be here with you guys and to talk all things Partners in Promise, EFMP, Special Education, Mill Spouses, that rock. And so, yes, I'm happy to be here. (laughs) Yeah. And and let's start with you just giving a quick snapshot of where you're at right now, because we had some good offline conversation about it. (laughs) So I am here at the Gaylord in D.C. at the Sea Airspace 2022. It is a fantastic gathering of all the sea services, mm. mainly just kind of highlighting the good work that they're doing, both you know within the, the Navy, the, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, 
also have gathering of industry leaders and research leaders. Of course, our DOD leadership is here as well, including mm. congressional leaders, you know, people who are big supporters of our sea services and what we need and how can we improve and just giving them a, the pulse of what's happening in our community. So I'm excited. My spouse was speaking on a panel today. Mm. It is the 100th you know, anniversary, I guess you could say, of the Navy aircraft carriers. So 100 years ago, mm. they did commission the very first aircraft carrier for the Navy. So very big year of continual events. He was able to speak on behalf of the, the Stennis. He's the CEO of the USS John C. Stennis. And I'm here as well as a Partners in Promise representative. We have a booth in the exhibitor area and uh, just kind of informing, you know, leaders of what we provide resources for our children in special education and in the military. And it's, it's been fantastic. Lots of great folks. I, uh, I was very excited. Jenny Lynn, I was thinking about you yesterday. I was invited to a reception and the secretary of the Navy was there and I was, you know, just conveniently located near him. <laughs> and, you know, a friend of mine's like, hey, let me introduce you to Michelle Norman, Navy spouse, and, you know, also said Navy spouse of the year for 2019. And I'm thinking, okay, Jenny Lynn, we got to get you in here next year. <laughs> well, it was a you. great, great, great opportunity to talk about military spouses and the great work that they're doing. Yeah. You know, in this mm -hmm. military community space and just to be able to amplify their effort and really just, you know, get these into the ears of leaders and to continue to support us in what we're doing because we are really here for them. The DOD can't do everything. And so right. how can we help, you know, continue mm -hmm. that that military family readiness? I love how you said specifically that the DOD can't do everything mm -hmm. and they can. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only so much of our taxpayer dollars we can take <laughs> from, right. from civilians. <laughs> It really, being a civilian, but being raised in a military family, I have learned that it's really up to us to know, mm -hmm. you know, what our needs are and to support one another. And so it's absolutely mm -hmm. inspirational to be able to have military spouses such as yourself, Michelle, to kind of be the change that you want to see or provide the resources that the DOD hasn't entirely been able to provide. So I just want to say kudos to you and also that your efforts have been recognized in so many ways. I know that you were the 2020 Heroes at Home Military Spouse of the Year <laughs> for Hampton Roads. So shout out Hampton Roads, which is Yay. where I live now. <laughs> <laughs> and also you were the 2019 AFI Navy Military Spouse of the Year awardee. So I just want to commend you. And also you were the keynote speaker, as I mentioned, at Mill Spouse Fest. So I just can't help but commend you for all of the advocacy and all the work that you have been doing. And of course, people are probably wondering, okay, so what does Michelle do? We'll get into that in a second. <laughs> all right, we'll get to that. The better question is, what doesn't Michelle do? Um, we are not all in the studio together because Michelle is at Sierra in space rather than in Hampton Roads. You know, maybe one of these yeah. days we'll all be in the podcast recording studio yeah. together. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Fun. Lovely. That would be really great. And, you know, all of those awards are just honors, you know, to be able to have that ability to speak on behalf of them, our military children that are exceptional, that have special needs. And so, you know, I'm. it's nice to be recognized. But, you know, I think about it in the greater terms of just, you know, all military spouses are doing fantastic work. And so it's just maybe I was working in an area that needed a little bit more spotlight on it too. And I've been very fortunate to have that personal experience to be able to storytell a little bit. I just have to do a shout out to my team who are fantastic military spouses, all have children with special needs. And mm. there is no way we would be where we are today without their hard work and dedication, researching and you know putting out fantastic products. There's no way one person could ever do this alone. And so thankful to be part of an amazing, you know, military spouse tribe. And I'm telling you, these these male spouses, I will say they're both mama and papa bears, right? Because we have <laughs> both. And right. it is amazing what you can do when you are passionate and you have those strong whys. And, and we definitely have that in our organization. Yeah. And I just want to express how much I respect the fact that even though I was here reading your awards, you took it as an opportunity to give a shout out to your tribe. And I love that. I think that more people in America should do that and, and not always take 100% credit for what's being done because it does take a village. It does take a team, right. a tribe to be able to accomplish a lot of what Partners in Promise has been able to accomplish so far. Absolutely. And I, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention you know, my own family and my fantastic spouse too, who you know, there are times where I have to say, I'm out. You got the kids. Yeah. And I know that you had a long day. I'm sorry. <laughs> so without a supportive spouse, you definitely, 
would not be able to accomplish what you would like. So um, shout out to my hubby for that. And also for these type of venues, such as this podcast, this is how we get the word out. This is that outreach that is so very important. I will say that recently I was approached by a wonderful young Navy spouse who's doing great things. And she was telling me all these great resources that she has. And, you know, being a little older, uh, I don't know if I really want to say that, but yes, yeah, been around a while. Seasoned. And I'm, I'm <laughs> Seasoned. Really right. Seasoned, salty, there right? And I'm listening to this. And, you know, when she finished telling me all that, then I'm like, well, this is fantastic. And I'm loving this because she's from a different generation. But I also said, you need to kind of do, I need you to connect with people, do some research because guess what? There's this app that already does that. And there's this course that already does that. You know, why are we all reinventing the wheel? And I said, Mm. here, here's the people you need to connect with so you can partner. Because if she is not seeing this as a young Navy spouse. And I think that we're missing opportunities to reach everybody. Maybe we're reaching only the generation that's on Facebook. Well, guess what? She's on TikTok and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many different venues when we need to utilize them all. And I also think about, you know, our families who have children with disabilities, having those different venues, whether it be a blog, a podcast, website that's in different languages, that's easy on the eyes. You know, people with disabilities also need to have access to it. So it's great to have all of these different ways to connect with our community. So that connection, those venues, podcasts, you know, I wish I had more time in the day really (laughs) to do all of the above, but you know, it's great to have those, those varieties. So thanks for what you guys are doing. I love that you're, you're bringing attention to these issues. Yeah. Well, thank you for recognizing our work. And I agree that It's beautiful how many different types of mediums and platforms are available to us today. It really allows so many people from different walks of life to maybe talk about the same cause as what we're talking about here with Partners in Promise. So it's all wonderful stuff. And I I do appreciate you acknowledging our work. I love that Michelle hit on like having a tribe and lots of support. I know, Jen, you met Michelle when we were all at Mill Spouse Fest together last fall. I have had the fortunate opportunity to run into Michelle a couple more times since then, (laughs) either by total accident at a Christmas party (laughs) or on purpose, you know, having her working with my Virginia Beach Cohen Veterans Network counterpart and having Michelle here in the clinic with us because a lot of the advocacy work Michelle does for EFMP families goes hand in hand with the mental health work that we do at the Cohen Veterans Network. We provide that caregiver support. And so, The Hampton Roads, the Virginia Beach Clinic has worked quite a bit with Michelle, getting resources and information out to the EFMP families in the area to let them know that like, hey, we're a resource for you. Like, we understand the heavy mental burden of caregiving for someone with special needs, whether it be a child or, you know, an adult family member or things like that. And so, you know, I love hearing you guys banter. I'm also happy (laughs) to have Michelle on because I've gotten to do a lot of work with her since meeting at Mill Spouse Fest last fall. It's amazing. It's amazing how much we have connected even more. And of course, you're doing great things um, as the 2022 <laughs> NAS spouse at Naval Base Norfolk Military Spouse of the Year. So you're going to do fantastic things this next year. And I'm super happy for you. And by the way, I don't know if your ears were burning a little bit, but I was at a retreat with some other national military service organizations. And we were talking about mental health of our youth and what we can mm. be doing. And multiple times I brought up the great work that you guys are doing because it's so needed right now in this Mm -hmm. time of Mm -hmm. life for our children. And of course, you know, everyone talks about the wait list. And I can't even imagine if we didn't have you guys there in the Hampton Roads area, what it would be like as far as that availability. So anyway, I would not have been able to speak to that without having these connections in place. And so that's really what it is. It's, um, you know, making sure we're reaching the right people mm-hmm. and being able to, to give these fantastic resources that are, that are very needed for our children. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. About that wait list, because I work for our excellent mental health company, you know, <laughs> I don't necessarily get to come here as a client. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I know here in Hampton Roads, like I have spent multiple hours on the phone looking Mm. for services for my own kids and my own family. And it is, it is quite a desert out there of resources and services right now. Yeah. With uh, 
wait list. I mean, to the point that they're like, hey, we have a TRICARE wait list, but it's full. And you're like, wait, how does a wait list full? I don't, what's happening? (laughs) It's such a problem everywhere, not just in Hampton Roads. And I think what we're trying to do is, you know, what's the root of the problem? How Mm -hmm. can we, you know, Mm -hmm. eliminate those pain points to even get to the point where you need to have some intervention of some sort. And so it's a complicated problem, but um, hopefully, yeah. you know, you've got the right minds on it and willing to look at policy, willing to, to figure out how to partner more with our civilian community. Um, there's just so many other things to consider, but I'm just thrilled that you guys are there. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Likewise. You're welcome. I want to go ahead and, and now get into detail about the work you do in Partners in Promise, Michelle. And I'm just going to read a little briefly from your website. And um, you have shared on your site that all children receiving special education are entitled to a free, appropriate public education. However, the data shows that there are systematic problems with special education for military families across the U.S. And the trend is many school systems are not providing the required standards of education. So then comes Partners in Promise, having been created in February 2020 right before the pandemic started. Mm. So I <laughs> want to hear that story, Michelle. Tell yeah. us about uh, like when you decided to do this. And I mean, here you are still being the nonprofit you are today. I mean, s- something must have stuck. <laughs> right. Well, and how many other nonprofits have come together during the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, <laughs> well, I will, I'll have to go back a little bit in history. So, you know, a lot of it stemmed from the year that I, I was more active in the community because of the, the Navy spouse of the year. And, you know, I think we were able to elevate, you know, that there are some challenges for our kiddos in education based on my daughter's story. And as, um, you know, the word got around and, and people were learning, you know, about what those educational hurdles were, I was fortunate enough to testify in March, no, February 2020, right before COVID hit with the House Armed Services Committee, Military Personnel Subcommittee about the EFMP program. I was able to share about our story, but I also had some top level ideas and solutions. Me and three other military spouses had worked together the year before on really how can we solve this problem at a policy at a federal level? And we came up with the Promise Act, which was like seven different initiatives for, you know, policy changes or or how to advise and educate in various areas, you know, what are the systemic issues and how can we solve it? And we worked with, you know, a couple of different, you know, leaders, both in the state and and federally. And so I was able to talk to about that with the, you know, the committee. And then we had a congressional briefing, I think a couple of weeks after that, that really kind of deep dived into what we were seeing and what data we had at the time. And then COVID came, but I didn't realize the momentum that really was spurred from those two events, you know, for that EFMP hearing, there were so many mill spouses that showed up that day. They had to open up an overflow room in that building. It was incredible. They were fired up. They were wanting to talk about the program and it just was electric in that room. I think we stayed to close the place down, you know, for like a couple hours more. It was just People were coming up to me like, this is what we needed. Someone saw us. Someone heard our story and was able to articulate it to those in leadership positions. But it wasn't complaining. It was with solutions. And so that momentum kind of just spilled over. And there's, a, you know, our COO and lead researcher, Jen Barnhill, she reached out to me. She's an amazing military Mm -hmm. family Mm -hmm. advocate, reporter, and journalist. And she reached out to me prior because she was writing an article about my testimony. And I'll be honest, you know, I was, it was tiring. I was exhausted. My spouse was still overseas in Italy. You know, all these great things were happening, but I just was spent. It, it really was us four spouses and two had to step away. So it was just me and the other one other co-founder that were trying to pull it all together. And then all these requests were coming in for us to advise and tell them more about the situation. I was really kind of spent. And so she, she wrote this great article. And about a month later, she called me back and said, Michelle, you're doing great things, but I sense you can use some help. (laughs) And I like almost cried like, yes, I do need some help. You know, it's not something easy to to admit that I I can't do all of this alone. Mm -hmm. And she's like, let me help you. And that was the start. 
really a partners in promise, even though formally, you know, a year later is approximately is when we became an official nonprofit. But without her, it was then a team of two. Mm. And then the team of two grew to a team of three. And then, you know, we ha- now have, you know, I think about four or five or six, you know, volunteers that work very, very hard. And I, we would not be where we are without their just amazing hard work and dedication because we did start off, you know, as all volunteer military spouses mm-hmm. and they all have kids with special needs. And so there are times where one has to step back. Um, you know, because maybe like, for instance, I had to go to Cincinnati a couple of times already with my daughter for medical care at Cincinnati Children's Hospital mm. for her airway. And so when I step back, someone else steps in, mm. you know, there's PCSing. We had one of our members had the PCS last year, so she had to step out. So, you know, it's great that we can do that. Mm-hmm. And we're hoping we can sustain, you know, eventually as our name gets out there and we get more sponsorships. But it really is that boots on the ground perspective, though, that that is very, it's valuable. Let's just say that there's not many other uh, organizations that are kind of really in the thick of it and can speak directly to it. And I think that's what um, families are, they just come to us. They're drawn Mm -hmm. to that, that person who gets it, Mm -hmm. you know, and can be open about their problems and not be dismissed. And so that really is what we're focused on. So we're focused on like basically three pillars, you know, elevating educating and advising. So we really do strive to kind of elevate those voices of EFMP families. We saw that at the hearing. We knew it was important. And so that was kind of a piece of it. So how do we tell these stories? And then of course, through a variety of ways, through blogs, through webinars, you know, through our newsletter, we just have a lot of different ways, podcasts and podcasts as well. And then we educate. So we educate those parents, those their students, and then leaders about special education law and then we connect them to resources. And I'll tell you, special education law is very complex. It's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is not something that you can just whip through and go, okay, I'm ready to practice it, this in the state of Virginia or in the state of Texas. It, it really is difficult and not everyone understands it. And so we're fortunate that you know our board and co-founder, Grace Kim, is a special education attorney. She was my attorney when I was having some difficulties Mm. with my daughter. And then the rest of us are all certified in special education advocacy. And so they're really, we do have that experience um, to help our families. And the last thing we do is we advise. We advise leaders, you know, with that goal of informed policy decisions to, to help remove those hurdles so that our military families really can have their service member focused, you know, on their job and military readiness. And so whenever we have these opportunities, you know, to talk to, for instance, last week I was at the Virginia Military Advisory Council and I was able to speak at keynote, speak on that and, you know, talk directly to installation commanders. And since we've had this annual survey, we've been able to brief other leaders, you know, within EFMP with, with different services, be able to talk to, you know, folks that are in the White House or, you know, within military and community and policy, there's just, that's how we educate them. You know, we deep dived, we found what's going on and how can we, you know, elevate that information and then think of solutions. So, you know, the last thing I'm going to touch on before we go into the survey is that, and I said this last week, we know that serving in the military is often a family business, right? Mm -hmm. You've always heard Mm -hmm. that you know, when someone serves and then their child serves and their child's each child, it just, it goes on and on. And I think it's really critical to make sure that all, you know, our military children are afforded that opportunity to mm-hmm. serve. And that is done through an appropriate education. So mm-hmm. we need to ensure that all our kids, you know, those with special needs, those without special needs, all of them are afforded a standard diploma, you know, an, an appropriate education, no matter where they are, so they can have you know, those same opportunities to serve. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's kind of what we see, you know, and not just serve, but then also to be, you know, those productive, those independent members of society that give back, you know, and contribute. You know, there's wonderful state programs and national programs that many people with disabilities, you know, need and utilize. But if there's an opportunity to give them that education so that they can go into the workforce, you know, that's a win-win for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm just taking everything that you're sharing, Michelle. And I have to ask, because I know that your daughter is has been a huge inspiration behind this. What has been her take on this whole experience? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, she was fortunate to come up with me. 
mm. to DC wow. when I testified and I made sure to ask her, is it okay mm. if I share your story? Wow. Mm. I think that's very mm. important as they age. Mm-hmm. To make sure that they're okay with some of the details because some of it is very, very personal on the right. challenges she has faced. A lot of anxiety that she has had that we're still dealing with it. You know, it's I have a lot of great friends on Facebook, but they don't even see what we're dealing with behind the scenes. You mm-hmm. know, a lot of mm-hmm. things that, you know, that she has to see specialists for. But I think she feels, you know, that this is important to be that voice for other kids that don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. she feels it's also somewhat of an honor to be able to share, you know, that story with others. And if you actually watch the video of the hearing, she was sitting behind me to the right. My mother-in-law was in town. Again, my husband was in Italy for a year and a half, so he was not there. And we had another co-founder that was there too. And so I knew she was back there and you know it's very (laughs) it's scary you know it's it's very you're very nervous at these things you don't know what to expect it was a full house and you know i was able to give my testimony and then austin carrick who is the executive director for you know the exceptional military family in the military efm and she told her story for the next five minutes and it was so emotional Mm -hmm. you can see on the video that marissa was visibly shaken and crying Mm -hmm. when she was listening to austin's story and i've had several acquaintances and friends reach out to me afterwards like wow you can tell that she feels it so much that this was not right and she doesn't verbalize that a lot but this has had such a huge impact in her life. And again, I think she thinks, you know, if she can help one family, then she has done her job, you know, that this will have scars on her for the rest of her life, but, you know, feels like it was worth it to be able to help others. And so I just had to make that comment because you can see in some of the pictures too, just like, you know, her face, it's, mm-hmm. her eyes are all watering and like, wow, we don't have an idea really of how this is truly impacting our kids. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it, it's been a journey. I will say that, you know, we, we realized it, the importance of that storytelling. But when we started talking about, you know, one of the questions we kept getting over and over is like, well, how many people are impacted? You know, mm. or if you go to a certain office for, let's say, a different state, well, like, how many of my constituents does that mm. really mm-hmm. include? And so, as you keep hearing that over and over again, we're like, where is the data? And so, we mm. started to dig. And there's some amazing organizations out there like Blue Star Families, who does their annual military lifestyle mm-hmm. survey. And they actually were starting to kind of look a little bit into EFMP, but it wasn't too, and we loved it. And it gave us the idea that there are some issues. And so we decided we're going to just do the deep dive because no one else is deep diving. No Mm -hmm. one's asking those hard questions. And so that's when we decided let's, let's up our game here on our annual survey, you know, because of the first one, I'll tell you, it was very grassroots (laughs) (laughs) and uh, we're looking like Google form and like, tell us a lot of that leading questions, very biased. It was all qualitative, but it really did give us that, you know, pulse of like, are we crazy? Because sometimes people were looking at us like, um, no, I've heard things have been great at all the schools for these kiddos. And so we did start looking like the crazy, you know, activists, I guess you could say. And that's not at all what we were trying to do. And so then we started, you know, coming up with a survey that would give us, you know, very good statistically significant data. And that's where Jen really led, led us in that realm, you know, we, we collaborated with um, UNC the first year and then last year it was with The Ohio State University. And I'm telling you, um, it was so eye-opening. Mm. Once you get the right research team um, in place and the mm-hmm. hard work that they've done and all of the, the lit reviews and it's just using the right survey instruments, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, mm-hmm. that's not my background. You know, I'm more the engineer and you know, that I never took statistics. So <laughs> this was a lot that I had to learn. And, you know, I'm sure that they're rolling their eyes every time I ask a question, but they've got it. So whenever there's something that's very specific, I, I refer them to the research team. <laughs> but at least I can brief on the overall data, you know, and, um, you know, that it's just, again, it's including both a storytelling, that qualitative piece, but then also having that quantitative piece. Mm-hmm. And people will stop and listen and go, okay, 
Now Mm -hmm. we're talking. Now I can act on those solutions because we know that these are the trends. These are the patterns. It's a systemic across the board. Then we know that it's a general policy that needs to be changed. Or Mm -hmm. if it's in one region, then we know that we need to focus on X, Y, Z in that one region. So it's it's been fantastic. So we're thrilled and we're, we're hopeful to be able to continue that level, high quality surveying every year so we can kind of keep track you know what's working what's not working how can Mm -hmm. we make changes and let's let's make sure we see those benchmarks and let's let's see if we can look at this in a longitudinal way so that we can one day not have to worry (laughs) as much because all the right policies will be in place and all the systems will be in place and that's that's where we're, we're hope to get one day Yeah, I'm just, uh, once again, taking everything in that you're sharing, Michelle, and I'm like, what do I even ask next? I know. (laughs) Y'all are on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have your amazing spouse tribe working together to Mm -hmm. not only storytell, but to have the data to back it up. Mm -hmm. And I am just uh, absolutely impressed. And I imagine that for any parent that has a child with special needs in education would really appreciate this conversation. Now, before I get into the next part of our conversation, I want to give a quick thanks to our sponsor, U.S. Vet Wealth. Health factors such as cancer, heart disease, and mental health can make the Survivor Benefit Plan a better choice financially than a private life insurance policy. However, there are many disabilities that are quite serious with regards to its effects on your daily life, but it doesn't necessarily impact your potential lifespan. All that being said, U.S. Vet Wealth believes that it's worth the time to discover whether or not your disability will prevent you from qualifying for options other than the Survivor Benefit Plan. Download the free copy of U.S. Vet Wealth's white papers titled Navigate Your Retirement Pay and Survivor Benefit Plan Alternatives to make a confident and informed decision on whether or not the Survivor Benefit Plan is right for you and your family. Our white papers are available for the following ranks, E7, E8, E9, O5, and O6 and are available to download for free with no email opt-in necessary at usvetwealth.com. Once again, the website is spelled U-S-V-E-T-W-E-A-L-T-H.com. And so all that being said, let's go ahead and just talk real briefly about the 2021 Military Special Education Survey findings, just so we can kind of, you know, create a little more awareness. And especially now that the data gets more significant, I think, every year because of right. the team that it takes, you know, the team that you have put together to make this possible. So I know that in the survey finding, you have three barriers that you mentioned. There's the real barriers, the perceived barriers, and the, mm-hmm. the unknown barriers. Let's start with the real barriers, Michelle. Right. No, you're absolutely right, Jen. And uh, those were the three key takeaways from the surveys of the barriers. So the real barrier that really pointed to what we had been talking about qualitatively for years. Um, and then we finally got the data. There are significant delays of our military children receiving special education after a PCS. And mm-hmm. that's tough because we know that transitions are difficult for all military kiddos. Mm-hmm. Um, right. When you see significant delays of those that have special needs, mm-hmm. it's way more amplified you know, exponentially. And that's a problem because IDEA, the the federal act I talked about earlier, there's very specific timelines associated with parts of that process of, you know, identifying if there's an issue, you know, having evaluations completed. Um, There's very specific timelines on on when things need to be in place. Mm -hmm. And then there's some areas that are kind of like, well, as soon as possible, like some of the wording is... (laughs) Is not super specific. <laughs> and then you have the states. The states each have to do the minimums, but sometimes some states put in additional protections, which is great. And some of them interpret parts of like, well, it should be done in 60 days. Well, is it 60 business days? Is it 60 oh. calendar days? Mm. So each state interprets things a little bit differently. But we have seen the pattern is systemic that all of the states showed delays in receiving those Mm. services after PCS. And I will just kind of give you a couple of stats. 77% of those who went without services after a move waited longer than 60 days. Again, that 60 days is kind of like a boom, boom, boom. But the average delay that was experienced after move was 5.75 months. And that again, 
5.7 months is a very long time. You know, that's nearly a quarter of a two year tour of duty. Yep. You know, because a lot of our folks, they're out and about, boom, sometimes even less than two years if they're going to like maybe a war college or, you know, a particular class, it's only a year long. Mm -hmm. It's that's difficult. And then when you think about, you know, our, our younger kiddos, you know, and, and when you may first suspect perhaps that there's a, there's an issue again, there's very specific timelines or IDA, Mm -hmm. but we have found with our military families, they're waiting 23 months Mm -hmm. from like an initial ID of an issue to then receiving services. And so that's frustrating. There's probably a PCS move somewhere in there, you know, likely Mm -hmm. like, okay, Mm -hmm. I'm seeing something. They said maybe to wait a little while, you know, maybe they're too young and then, okay, maybe we need to kind of evaluate. Maybe it starts in one place. They're not finished. And then you move. And then the next school might say, well, you know, we haven't got to, you know, have a chance to meet Susie. Let us have a couple of months and meet Susie. Mm-hmm. And then let's come back to the table and see if we really need to do some more evaluations, you know, because so you can see how this gets drawn out. Right. But really, you're supposed to have that 60 day. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, I will say that, you know, there's definitely some top states that were had reported violations. And, <laughs> you know, those are the ones we're probably going to try to focus on more than others. But the patterns in the data show it's, it's systemic across the board. So what can we do, I think, as far as, you know, an organization to help these families and knowing that this is a problem? And one thing that we are doing and, and really trying to amplify and create an awareness program for is uh, advanced enrollment. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of advanced enrollment. 33 states right now are um, have legislation within their general assemblies that talk about advanced enrollment. I think maybe we'll be up to like maybe 40 or 44 by the end of this year. But so what advanced enrollment is, let's say you're in California and you're moving to Texas and you've got, you actually have written orders. Woohoo! And so you can actually <laughs> <laughs> send those written orders. I know I laugh, right? Because how many of us actually get written orders in a reasonable mm-hmm. amount of time? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it happens. It does happen. So let's say you have the written orders and you have an IEP. We are saying to families like, hey, send that as soon as possible to mm-hmm. one of those 33 states and get it in the hands of the right people. Mm-hmm. They can see that IEP. They can see the services and supports that child you know, already has, and they can have it ready for day one. What a great win-win, right? Mm. You know, something we hear often as a family that has a child with special needs, you get to that new school district, even though you sent it like months before the IEP. You'll get there and you'll meet the teachers and they're like, I am so sorry. I have not seen the IEP yet. Mm-hmm. And so wow. it takes, and then of course now they want a meeting and you're mm-hmm. like, oh my goodness, I gave this to you four months ago. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, where are the barriers within that entire process? You know, mm-hmm. why is it not getting into the hands it needs to get to? And the other thing is no one knows about advanced enrollment. You know, we asked our families in our survey, do you even know it? And only 16% of our families said that they're aware of advanced enrollment, that they actually used it. But when we looked back at where they were actually based, based on their current location, and then they were, we asked, you know, were you ever told, they were told they couldn't use advanced enrollment. They said it was not an option. They lived mm. in one of those 33 states. Mm. And you're like, oh my goodness. So the school districts maybe don't even know mm. <laughs> that they have advanced enrollment option. So we're just going to try to to keep talking about this, find out where those states are, get that IEP in the hands as quickly as possible that we can try to shorten those timeline delays. You know, that really is where we're going with advanced enrollment. It's like, how do we make it to where our kids can get their services on day one? So that that's probably the biggest thing for that. And just what what supports can we do? How do, can we make, how can we speed up that process? Because there's a lot that happens in 5.75 months. I mean, there's mm-hmm. loss instruction, there's regression. And oh, by the way, because your child's not able to get correct transportation or the correct supports are probably not going to have some more mental health issues, right? Mm-hmm. So it just, you know, compounds. It really does compound. And it's harder to to get back to speed. And oh, by the way, you're moving again. So <laughs> yeah. that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of like the whole cycle. And we need to break that cycle. So that's kind of the first thing. That's the, the real delays. And I know you talked about the perceived barrier of lack of recourse. You know, when a, a problem happens, 
Mm-hmm. You know, our families are not elevating it. Mm-hmm. So I guess you could say the good news is that we found our families only 20% ever had filed a complaint. And mm-hmm. we asked, you know, complaint could be just writing a, an email to the teacher, like something's not going right, you know, or maybe writing the superintendent or the principal, or maybe going to a school board meeting and having a couple minutes and talking. So that's like informal, but there's also formal ways to elevate a problem. And that's really the only ones they talk about in the, the federal law. You know, you have to kind of file a state complaint. It's a written signed complaint, mm. or you can file for due process. Those are like the formal ways. So we asked our families, what are you doing? You know, if mm-hmm. you have had a problem and only 20% said that they, they did anything. And most of them were informal. Most of them like were very casual and formal. Mm-hmm. But we asked, you know, well, if you didn't, you know, is there a reason why? And we found that over 70% of our families said, yeah, yeah we could have filed a complaint, but it, it wasn't worth the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We knew that mm-hmm. wasn't going to matter. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. a problem because that is really the only recourse, according mm-hmm. to this federal law, to try to reconcile anything. Mm-hmm. And so when you feel like it's not going to matter, I'm going to move eventually, it's too much stress, it's too expensive to figure out, how do we help those families be able to kind of revisit and, and try to make sure that there are no barriers for them to be able to elevate it to the next level? So that really was the biggest thing on perceived lack of recourse. There are systems in place. It's just they think it's not going to help. Mm, So that's Mm -hmm. sad. And the last one was the unknown barrier. That really is the relationship between access to information and its relationship to positive education outcomes. Mm. So basically, the less access you have to the correct information, you're going to have more negative education outcomes. And Mm -hmm. so when I Mm -hmm. think about that, it's more like, well, Let's say you didn't know about EFMP and you didn't know about special ed resources. The chances are you're not receiving Mm -hmm. special ed in that new place. Chances are you're probably spending some money out in town Mm -hmm. for supplemental services. And we also found that a lot of them were not in the least restrictive environment compared to their civilian peers. And so that's a problem. It's like we need to figure out how to let these families know, how do we educate them about these supports that are out there? How do we let them know about these new special education attorneys? You know, they're on each installation that we advocated for. 76% of them didn't even know that was even an option. And Mm -hmm. that was mandated in the 2021 NDAA. How do we let them know that? How do we let them know about the MIC-3 that's available for all military families to help when they move from state to state or the advanced enrollment? right? All these wonderful benefits, but they just don't know. Mm -hmm. And so we have to work on educating, advising them, but also our leaders so that they can tell them and figure out what their messaging is, because you got to figure out who your audience is. Just like you guys have this podcast, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, are people going to websites to get their information? Mm -hmm. I love military one source, don't get me wrong. But these young people, they may not be a military one source. They may want to just, again, be on you know Mm -hmm. facebook or TikTok, so we really need to reframe how we're getting messages out and you know is it you know the the first line of the the school liaison officer and that efmb coordinator maybe they need to be contacting them or often when they're a new family who's come to the area so there's a lot of things we need to keep digging down and and those are some of our recommendations and just to keep this dialogue going of how can we help them Mm-hmm. be able to help their families. You know, we are here as a resource, but we're also asking the hard questions and and hopefully looking, you know, from again, the top level down. Yeah. So yeah, it's a big year, great year, lots of data. And we are very excited about the next one. We're already starting our planning. <laughs> awesome. The next one that's going to launch. Um, yeah, it launches in September. We usually wait for people to get into the school, mm. maybe settle down for a few weeks. And then we start asking the questions because that's when a lot of change happens, you know, those yeah. first 30 to 60 days. And so we try to, to keep our annual survey from September to October, and then hopefully get the, the initial results by the end of December, and then start briefing it out in January. So that's kind of our mode as of late. And it's been great. We've, we've seen a lot of people who, they just really care about our yeah. families. And so they just weren't really sure how to help them. And so mm-hmm. Lots of great partners, lots of great allies. We can use more just to kind of get the word out of who we are and how we can help these families, get them in 
just kind of put them on the right m- roadmap. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of that, that's kind of what we're doing, and just letting them know they're not alone. They have a tribe, and so sometimes that's they need to hear that. It, it can be a very lonely world having a child that requires a lot of medical care or educational care and sometimes in this military world people are afraid to speak up they have that stigma of that life is not the all american everything is great at home you know and it can be very isolating you know there's times where i remember i couldn't go to a squadron event because of my daughter i couldn't leave her mm. with anyone She's just, it was very unique. We didn't have respite care at the time. I'll tell you what, those respite care programs are amazing. Mm -hmm. And we would not be where we are today in this Navy career without it. So Mm -hmm. again, it's just, it's different. It's a different journey. And it's one I would never change. But, you know, these families need to know that there's people who understand, they Mm -hmm. care, they're working hard on their behalf, and that we got their back. Yeah, it just gets me to think about like, when I was a military kid, it was already difficult enough being fully abled mm-hmm. to like yeah. find my footing. And mm-hmm. even in my adult life, I still feel like my mindset's like, okay, is, is something going to shift in my life every two to three years or every five mm-hmm. to six years? And that's still something I struggle with today. And so I can only imagine how much difficult it could be for children with special needs. And so, right. Michelle, I think the work that you and your team, because um, got to acknowledge the tribe, that are <laughs> right. doing, doing incredible, <laughs> incredible work. And I like that specific goal of the timeline. Okay. And, you know, as we close here, because I know, I know we all have to jump onto something else <laughs> in about a minute. Let us know, what is a recent win? Let's wrap up with that. What is a recent <laughs> win that you just feel so compelled to sharing to, to end our conversation with some hope? Gosh, that's really great. I think for us, the acknowledgement of needing those special education attorneys was a very big win for us. Mm. And so ensuring that that program is implemented correctly um, is what we're we're continuing to do. And knowing that the EFMP program is supposed to be, uh, should be standardized, those are great wins for our families because it, again, acknowledges that there's problems and it's run differently by service branch. And so the fact Mm -hmm. that we were able Mm -hmm. to, to get those attorneys It just validates their stories that this is a difficult world to navigate and that we do need that support. You know, we cannot, this is such a federal law that's really parent enforced. It really puts that parent in that position to have to speak up. And so when you have someone you can go to, you know, that kind of can share that burden with you. (laughs) Yeah. That's huge. It's really huge. You know, I think just having someone go to a meeting with you sometimes Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. which was another huge win for us is just someone who can sit there and they don't even have to say anything, but just, you know, when you have 17 people around a room and you just, you, you know, and if you have any questions or, you know, again, our military, you know, I think community has, we, we respect authority. It's very difficult to speak up sometimes where just mm-hmm. if anyone in authority is telling us something, you're like, okay, that sounds great. You know, that's just the way this, this life is for us. And so it is hard when you have, you know, maybe a different opinion about something. So uh, having someone from the EFMP program or even the attorney be able to sit in that meeting and just know that they have your back is a great thing. Because again, it's all about that connection and that tribe and that we're in this together, you know, to make sure that these kiddos will get that diploma if they can and, you know, just be a really valuable part of our community. Michelle, I just think it's great what you and your team are doing to reduce stigma around this. bringing all of that information to light and continuing to dig. I think that the subsequent years that you do this will continue to reduce the stigma for the EFMP families. And for those of us who, who, like you said, want to support EFMP families. I mean, I have been on the teaching side of those IEPs and it is an incredibly difficult position for everyone in the room when you know somebody needs the support and either. You didn't get it in time. You know, I mean, there's so many right. layers to that. And the fact that you guys are like digging through those and then taking them to the people who can make those organizational changes. I just, I am grateful for you. And and I wanted to be noted on the show that though Michelle is a Navy spouse like myself and things do differ across services and they are working across services, service branches, let me make it clear, across service <laughs> branches to, you know, get everybody the help they need. Like this is not singular to one service branch. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but I will say 
go Navy. They led the way. <laughs> <laughs> they led the way with the pilot programs for those EFMP attorneys um, in Hampton Roads of San Diego. Woo, woo. <laughs> and I will say the Marine Corps already had started that. In fact, the Marine Corps is hiring their third awesome. attorney in Quantico wow. starting in June. And so, you know, that's that I love seeing our sea services kind of going forward with, with the great things. And I will say with the Coast Guard, their mutual aid society also offered grants for families during COVID and now mm. um, to help them get an advocate, you know, or help them get an attorney because um, they were seeing a lot of issues mm. that spurred from COVID because mm-hmm. we didn't even touch COVID, but right. That was a oh, nightmare for yeah. so many of our families. So I will just say that, you know, the sea services are rocking it. And so is the air force. They have amazing, amazing allies over there and great Facebook pages and the central cell. So and even the armies, you know, go on track with their JAGs. So a lot of good things. We just need to standardize it. And mm-hmm. it's thrilling. And seeing those, those senior leaders, you know, hopping on board and seeing the value of this is just, you know, that's what we always needed. You know, it's just having that ear of those who can make a difference. So thank you, Jenny Lynn. It's always great <laughs> working with you. We'll Absolutely. keep working on that stigma thing together, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, yeah. we'll chase down the right people at the right uh, parties we're at. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll get you here next year. And I'll, I'll get you, you know, in front of a couple of people as well. <laughs> Perfect. It's great. It is Love great. It. Well, I know, Michelle Norman, in order for people to learn more about Partners in Promise, they can check out thepromiseact.org. Any other resources that you want to share before we go? Well, we are putting all sorts of things out through our newsletter and our Facebook page. I would say, you know, follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn, um, Instagram, and you will see all of our tips and tricks throughout the month. You know, a lot of them are geared towards PCSing, which is, you know, very close to that time of year where you have to start doing your research and getting your IEP binder together. We have videos on that, how to prepare for those last IEP meetings so that you can set yourself up for success at the next duty station. And again, that advanced enrollment. So I say, follow us because every single day we are sharing some type of action or resource for these families. And on our website as well, there's a toolkit that people can download as well. So we're here for you. Reach out if we can help anybody, point them in the right direction, or if they want to share their story and see areas that we might be able to help with, we're, we're happy to do that. Well, Michelle, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope that our listeners got a lot out of today. Of course, if you want to get a hold of her and learn more about the organization, you can check it out in the show notes. So thank you all so much for listening. And we'll chat with you in the next episode. Tune in next time. Hey, thanks again for joining us at Holding Down the Fort by U.S. Vet Wealth. Once again, I am your co-host, Jen Amos. And I'm Jenny Lynn Stroop. Thank you so much for listening to our show. If you've gotten a lot out of our conversation today, be sure to leave us a five-star rating review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Or you can leave us a kind LinkedIn recommendation on our LinkedIn profiles. Learn more about Holding Down the Fort by visiting holdingdownthefortpodcast.com. And there you'll also be able to find us on social media and how to contact us directly. Thank you all so much for joining us. Until next time. Oh,